Good morning. Welcome to Let in the Workplace, the New Science. I'm Barbara Plogg. I'm the director of the Continuing Education Program for the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. COEH, as we call it, is a NIOSH Education and Resource Center, Education and Research Center, excuse me. And we are very happy to have you here today in Berkeley and online. And our good morning to our audience online. A couple of housekeeping details for people here. Emergency exits, just in the unlikely event we should get an earthquake today. Uh, there are two emergency exits, the door which you entered on your right and a door in the corner on your left. And either one will lead you, the one on the, your left will lead you straight outside, the one on your right will lead you to the lobby. If we do have an earthquake, duck and hold till the shop shaking start, stops and then uh, exit and we'll take stock. So we'll exit out through the lobby onto the sidewalk and we'll all have a fine time. The restrooms, a more likely event that you'll need the restrooms. <laughs> exit out the right door th um, through which you entered. Turn left and go down the hallway, both ladies' and men's restrooms. I want to just quickly go through the packet of material that re you received this morning, if you'll take that out. You'll see that on the left-hand side is the agenda, a sheet that tells you how many continuing education credits you can earn at this seminar. And we have a sign-up sheet outside for uh, nursing credits and CMEs for physicians. Otherwise, you'll be getting a certificate for the, um, a general certificate which, for, for which you can claim your hours with. Go back a little bit and you'll come to a yellow sheet. That's the evaluation for today. We would like you to take it out and fill it out as we go through the day and hand it to us at the end of the day. And online folks, you also have an evaluation sheet that we'd like you to fill out. And then on the right side of your packet are the slides for today's presenters. So it'll make it easier to take notes. So I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our moderator for the day, Dr. John Howard. John Howard is the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Dr. Howard also serves as the, as the administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Howard was first appointed in 2002 during the George Bush administration and served in that position until 2008. In 2008 and 2009, he worked as a consultant with the U.S. government's Afghanistan Health Initiative. In September 2009, Dr. Howard was again appointed NIOSH director in the Obama administration. Prior to his appointments as NIOSH director, he served as chief of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health, or as we know it here in California, Cal OSHA. He served in that position from 1991 through 2002. So we're, we're welcoming, him, welcoming, welcoming him back to the state today. <laughs> Dr. Howard received his Doctor of Medicine degree from Loyola University, a Master's of Public Health degree from Harvard School of Public Health, a Master of Law degree in Administrative Law and Economic Regulation from George Washington University. He's board certified in Internal Medicine and Occupational Medicine. And we're very happy to have him here today. Thank you, Barbara. 
Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to join all of you and thank the uh, Center for Occupational Environmental Health uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and UCSF. Um, I also wanted to thank the David Brower Center, this wonderful auditorium that we're in, uh, for their cooperation uh, to hold this seminar. I want to thank Brian and Ilana, who are our IT support, Mary, who is our timekeeper, and, uh, and all of you who have joined us today and have traveled uh, from quite a distance. We have 110 folks registered here from four different states. Uh, we have 73 individuals on uh, the web site um, from 17 different states and four different countries. Uh, and we have 42 groups registered of multiple people from 13 different states. So I want to thank all of you for making time in your busy schedule for traveling uh, for science sake. Uh, it's extremely important uh, that we uh, are all here today. Just to uh, give you an explanation of the format uh, for today, we're going to have three presentations this morning uh, on uh, the various scientific dimensions of, uh, of lead in the workplace. Uh, two of the presentations are going to be back to back. They will break for lunch. Uh, there's plenty of places to eat here. Just follow your nose or ask a local uh, where to eat. Uh, we're going to then have a question and answer period uh, in the afternoon uh, after our four discussants, uh, who will get 10 minutes each to respond to the three presentations uh, in the morning and early afternoon, uh, will we'll be able to, uh, to ask questions. Now, the way we're going to do questions, uh, we'd like you, for everyone here in the room, to put your question on a white card any time during the day and put it in that lovely bowl there on the table so that we can look at it, organize it, uh, and, uh, and be efficient in asking uh, the discussants and the panelists uh, their, uh, their responses. For those of you uh, on the web, uh, there is, uh, you can ask questions via ReadyTalk. Uh, there's a help button if you have problems with that. Uh, and, uh, and we welcome all of your questions uh, for folks on the web. Uh, we realize that people may have uh, issues they want to think about or they want to ask the presenters later on. Uh, so if you'd like to follow up about a specific question, uh, then the contact information for the speakers and the panelists uh, is, uh, is in your packet. Uh, this is a science symposium. Uh, it's a science symposium for the nation. Uh, so we're not interested in uh, issues that relate to regulatory matters. We're not interested in any particular state's orientation uh, or the U.S. orientation. We're talking about science today and all of its applications and, and dimensions. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the organizers for having this symposium. It's extremely important. Lead, as you know, has been with us uh, for many, many thousands of years. It's still with us. We're still struggling with it uh, to protect not only workers, uh, but also the general population. So we're going to start right away with our first presenter, Michael Kosnett, who is an associate clinical professor in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and an associate adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Prior to moving to Colorado in the 1990s, he was a member of the Occupational Medicine and Medical Toxicology faculties at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Kosnett has had a long-standing clinical and research interest in the health effects of lead and other heavy metals. He has served on several EPA science advisory board panels pertaining to lead in air, dust, and water, and on the CDC Advisory Committee on Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention. He has written and lectured extensively in the U.S. and abroad on the clinical evaluation and management of lead exposure in adults and children. Dr. Kuznick. Thank you, Dr. Howard. It's a, a, a pleasure to uh, be here. I, I uh, always enjoy coming back uh, to California. I went to medical school here and um, began my work uh, and my interest in lead um, more than 30 years ago. And today uh, is a great opportunity to uh, talk to you about uh, where we've come uh, as a scientific community, actually, in the past several decades. And so uh, we're just launching up here, and um, we'll begin. No, this is, this is mine. 
That, that wasn't it. Great. Okay, great. We're going to talk a lot um, today about blood lead and, and how it relates um, to various health effects, particularly in the occupational setting. And lead in whole blood is the most common you know, clinical measurement that has been used uh, over, over the past 50 or more so years to assess and evaluate a worker's exposure to lead. Now, the OSHA lead construction, the OSHA standards, both in construction and general industry, were adopted in the mid to late 1970s. And a blood lead concentration of 50 micrograms per deciliter um, has remained um, actually since the OSHA construction standard for lead was developed at 50 micrograms per deciliter, where it is today, and that a person can return to work when their blood lead concentration falls below 40. Now, at the time that the OSHA standards, the, particularly the general industry standard, um, was adopted, the average blood lead concentration in the United States was in the teens. The geometric mean was 12.8. Today, we know that lead has fallen dramatically across the country in terms of the, the overall exposure as a consequence of the phase out of lead and gasoline, um, the uh, curtailment of the use of lead-based paints, and also uh, diminished use of lead in canned food. And the average uh, blood lead concentration in the United States is 1.1. As we have seen these dramatic decreases, and science has shown us and, and has elucidated effects of lead at lower levels of exposure, we recognize scientifically, and that's one of the things I hope to uh, discuss with you today, that these standards that were developed in the late uh, 1970s are insufficiently protective of the health of workers and need to be revised. This, the challenge is not just here in California and in the United States, but the challenge and the necessity for this is worldwide. This is a, a chart I developed uh, prior to a talk that I gave in Prague uh, two years ago. Um, when looking around the world at various standards for lead uh, in the workplace and levels that necessitate removal. And as you can see, um, they're all rather pretty high um, relative to today's prevailing blood lead concentrations. And uh, the UK and Japan and Russia are uh, you know, at 60 and 50, and even some of the European countries, which are a bit lower, are still in the range of 25 to 40. Now, why am I concerned that these uh, standards are insufficiently protective? I base that on the fact that in recent decades, there's been considerable body of work that shows that the chronic effects of cumulative lead exposure have contributed to substantial public health problems, particularly hypertension and cardiovascular disease. There is some evidence to indicate that lead may have adverse effects on renal function at lower levels and at cognitive dysfunction, particularly uh, in adults, con contributions of cognitive dysfunction that appear and become more manifest later in life. And then there's also concerns about the acute effects of lead on reproductive function. And I want to outline for you some of the most important work that I believe has come forward. I don't have time in this short presentation to give you a comprehensive review of the topic. It's enormous. But I want to show you about some studies that I think are particularly well uh, conducted and particularly influential and are persuasive to us as a public health community in acknowledging the fact that we need to be concerned about lower levels of lead exposure. Let's for, uh, talk first about the relationship between lead and blood pressure. This has been studied through a coherent group of different experiments and observations. There's been animal studies where you can uh, feed animals lead and they develop high blood pressure. There's been extensive study of in vitro and, uh, in vi um, and 
mechanisms in biological preparations, such as the tail arteries of rodents that have been exposed to lead, which establish mechanistic basis for how lead can contribute to increased vascular tone and increased blood pressure. And perhaps most significantly, there's been substantial human epidemiological evidence. This is uh, not a new study, but I think it's a, an elegant one uh, that was conducted by Dr. Fine and published in the journal Toxicology and Applied Pharmacology um, in the late 1980s. And what he did is he took six uh, three-month-old female dogs and their matched litter mates, and he fed them lead acetate or placebo for five months. And the dogs were trained, and they were able to get without uh, any kind of sedation, they were able to take blood pressure measurements in, in these dogs. And at 15 weeks of age, the, the dogs who were exposed to lead had a blood pressure, of th uh, excuse me, a blood lead of 35.8, and the uh, controls had 9.2. And look at the blood pressure difference. The blood pressure in the lead exposed dogs was 120, and those in the uh, control dogs was 108. And this is a chart uh, from that paper. The, the uh, hatch marks here are the lead exposed, uh, the blood pressure in the lead exposed dogs. And you can see at all these age points, the dogs exposed to lead had a higher blood pressure. This increase that you're seeing here in the first uh, uh, weeks of life is just uh, what happens with puppies as they become older, even the control animals raise their blood pressure. But there's definitely that decrement here. Now this is done in dogs. Uh, uh, studies that are often done in higher mammals as opposed to rodents are more relevant to humans. But I have to tell you, this has not just been done in dogs. It's been done in other animals. Uh, the effects have been seen in rabbits and been seen in mice and rats and many other animals. What about humans? And let's turn to the epidemiological evidence, because the epidemiological database is particularly interesting and relevant. And a unique issue, and I think I want to particularly emphasize to you, is that when we talk about concerns for low-level lead exposure in the workplace, for example, lead levels in the teens, we can take advantage of the fact that the human general population lead exposure that occurred uh, prior to the 1980s actually was in the teens. Remember I said on my, on my earlier slide that the geometric mean lead, blood lead concentration in the United States uh, in the NHANES uh, 2 study was 12.8? There were basically millions of people in our country, many of us in this room, most of us probably in this room, who had blood levels in the teens. So there, the, general, the studies that have been conducted in the general population that existed at that time of the relationship between lead and various endpoints is very relevant when we're talking about occupational lead exposure in the range of 10 to 20. So let's look at this particular study, which was um, conducted in the NHANES database, the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation uh, survey, which uh, has been conducted uh, multiple times by the Centers for Disease Control. They had, of the approximately 20,000 people that they examined and reviewed their health status in detail, about a little less than half of them had blood lead measurements. At the time, in this particular uh, uh, cohort, the, the uh, mean blood lead concentration was 13.1, and they found in modeling that blood lead was significantly associated with both systolic and diastolic blood pressure after they controlled for age, body mass index, a number of demographic factors, and multiple nutritional factors that uh, could possibly relate to hypertension. After they inserted numerous, numerous variables that are present and collected in the NHANES database, the relationship between lead in blood and blood pressure remained robust. A companion paper to this was published um, by Dr. Perkle in 1985 using this same NHANES data set. And he decided to focus in on, for this, for purposes of illustration in this study, on white males between the ages of 40 to 59. And he, he uh, had approximately, he had um, 564 
uh, individuals in that data set. And this regression line is based on all 105, 564. He's reduced it for purposes of illustration to 25 data points, but each of these points represents a coalescence of the nearest uh, 22 or 23 uh, observations. But one of the things I want you to see here is that after they adjusted for important covariants, uh, age, body mass index, uh, cigarette smoked, numerous nutritional variables, they found that as you increase blood lead from about 6 to 38, you had a 10-point increase in diastolic blood pressure. And that's a very substantial increase uh, in terms of public health. And one of the things he actually did in his paper is he looked at uh, this slope, this relationship, and he, and he, he looked at the Framingham Heart Study, which looked at the relationship between bl blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. And he said, this will have a major, I mean, this contribution has a major contribution to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And he predicted that if we lowered blood lead, we would see an improvement. And uh, his observations are actually prescient, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some, some data which actually shows the relationship between lead and cardiovascular disease shortly. Now, this study was conducted in a very large and very uh, reliable data set, the NHANES data set. But there have been multiple other studies that have been conducted on the relationship between lead and high blood pressure. And these are charts of two uh, meta-analyses which have been published, one by Joel Schwartz in 1995, um, one by Narat et al. in 2002. Um, and I don't want you to... the, 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 the small print here of the various studies is not what I want to illustrate here. What I want to illustrate here is that when you double blood pressure, when you go from 5 to 10 um, and you look at the change, look at all these studies. What do you notice? There's a, a very strong preponderance of all the studies pointing in the same direction. And the same thing here. Here, Dr. Schwartz said what would happen in, the, in terms of decrease if you went from 10 to 5, but it's a linear relationship, so it's basically the increase you would see if you went from uh, five to 10. And what you notice is all the studies are leaning in the same direction. You know, when I look at something like this and I see multiple studies pointing in the same direction with similar intensity and they're performed in different populations by different investigators at different points in time of people with different levels of blood lead and they're all seeing the basic same thing, it really in increases your confidence in, in, the, in the relationship. You know, it's very quite possible that a isolated study would be flawed or subject to confounding. But when you see th this many studies showing the same trend, you really have to be impressed with the underlying uh, causal relationship. And you have to be impressed, too, because it's not just epidemiology. You have the animal experiments, where you're exposing animals, and you have the mechanistic studies which look at the effects of lead on vascular tone and tissue involving things like calcium and, and uh, oxidative stress that also support these observations. Now, one of the things you might think about is, OK, if you double blood lead concentration, and this, this relationship is for a doubling of blood. blood. I, I illustrated it here to 5 to 10. It could be for 10 to 20. You might say, well, the, there's only a one millimeter or, or, or 1.25 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure. Is that significant? Well, you know, that's an average across the whole population studied. And it's quite possible with an endpoint like blood pressure that not everyone has similar sensitivities. Um, take, for example, this observation here. This is a hypothetical data set in which you have some people for which there's a very strong relationship between blood lead and blood pressure, but you have a lot of people that aren't sensitive at all. Okay? You would still see this positive relationship. Now, if you had a data set like that, you would see a significant slope, but you might see a lot of variability or a low R squared. And you might see uh, heterogeneity in the avariance or heteroscedasticity. And in fact, many studies have actually shown that. And it's quite possible that some people have a very strong relation, uh, are very sensitive to lead-induced blood pressure, and that the average for them of a doubling would be much more than one millimeter. Okay. Um, 
Think, if you will, for another ion that uh, is very important in blood pressure, sodium. But not everyone has sodium-sensitive blood pressure. So when you see a mean of maybe one or two millimeters, bear in mind that that could be driven by people for which there's a very substantial increase that's in excess of that. And also bear in mind that what we looked at in this previous, uh, these previous studies was the, the relationship between blood pressure and lead in blood. And lead in blood, while it's the most um, overall useful uh, biomonitor of, an, of the amount of lead circulating in the body at a given point in time, is not necessarily a reliable indicator of a person's long-term cumulative lead exposure. Greater than 90% of the lead in, in the body, and, and perhaps greater than 95% in adults, is found in the skeleton, where it has a half-life of years to decades. And there is a technology called non-invasive measurement of lead in bone by K-X-ray fluorescence, depicted in this photograph here, which has enabled individuals to measure non-invasively the lead concentration of the bone. And studies that have compared people's cumulative lead exposure by looking at blood lead over time have found that there's a very good correlation between a single 30-minute measurement. This man is sitting here and getting his uh, um, bone lead uh, measure, measurement conducted over a 30-minute period. The x-ray, by the way, the radiation exposure associated with this is less than a single dental bite wing x-ray. This single measurement is a good... Um, indicator of that individual's cumulative lead exposure. And this picture was actually uh, taken by Dr. Todd, uh, who uh, is the colleague of Dr. Landrigan, who, who is going to speak with us later. But this is from one of the investigations at, uh, done at Mount Sinai. Now, blow, bone lead has therefore been used as a marker of cumulative lead exposure, and there's been some very important and powerful observations made about the relationship between cumulative lead exposure as expressed by measurements of lead in bone and cardiovascular outcomes, including hypertension. And this uh, paper that I'm uh, going to talk to you about was one that was published in JAMA in 1996. And it took advantage of the normative aging study. The normative aging study, many of you might know about it, was a a prospective cohort study that began in, in 1961 in the greater Boston area. And they enrolled 2,280 healthy community-dwelling men in a study. And no one was allowed into the study if they had heart disease, if they had asthma, if they had lung disease, diabetes, cancer. They had to be healthy people. They couldn't have high blood pressure. And the idea was we're going to follow this cohort of healthy men who were, I think, at the time between the ages of 20 to 80. And we're going to follow them forward, and we're going to see how, what diseases they develop and how that might relate to various dietary things, other things in their life that uh, other exposures may, may have had. Beginning in 1988, they started measuring uh, blood lead. And beginning in 1991, uh, at, with Dr. Hu and his group at Harvard, they started measuring bone lead. And then, in, after a period of time when they had uh, accrued d uh, data, they decided to conduct a case control study. They looked at 146 of these men who were hypertensive and uh, 442 match controls who had a mean age of about 66. And they looked at what would predict who developed hypertension. And mind you, this is a general population sample. These aren't lead workers. These are people who, are, who work in banks, who are clerical workers, retail people. Some of them are blue collar, some of them are white collar. The wide diversity of occupations. The average, uh, the mean blood lead at the time was 6.3 micrograms per deciliter. And they found that of all the different variables they looked at, there were only three things that predicted who would get, who would develop hypertension. One of them was body mass index. One of them was whether you had a family history of hypertension. And one of them was the tibia concentration of lead. Okay. This is a general population sample of men in the United States. Of all the various things that would predict that whether you're hypertensive, lead was one of them, and the long-term cumulative exposure. It wasn't blood lead. It was bone lead. 
a measure of long-term cumulative exposure. And in fact, going from the lowest quintile of bone lead to the highest quintile, which was 29 micrograms per gram, the odds of being hypertensive increased by 50%, the odds ratio of 1.5. And we'll return to this point in a moment. But it wasn't just this study that found that. There, was another, there were other studies that found this as well. And I think this study is very interesting, too. Also done by the Harvard group, the lead author here was uh, Susan Corrick, who also worked with Dr. Who. And they decided they would look at the nurse's health study. And they took a subset. The nurse's, nurse's health study is a very large prospective cohort study of nurses and their, and their health. Um, and they decided to look at 89 hypertensive nurses and 195 controls to see what would predict in a logistic model um, what, made, uh, what, what were con contributing factors to hypertension. And they found that bone lead was, the bone lead of nurses was a contributing factor, a significant contributing factor. Uh, after adjustment for age, body mass index, dietary sodium, and again, family history of hypertension, when you went from the 10th percentile to the, 30, uh, to the 90th percentile, you had an odds ratio for hypertension of 1.86. And the blood lead concentration of the nurses at this time was three. So, and nurses are not particularly exposed to lead. What was their exposure? Their exposure, these nurses were exposed to the lead that they grew up with when they were um, most, because you know, these nurses uh, were, were uh, many, they, these are, nurses were particularly uh, growing up at a period of time when blood leads were in the teens. And those who had more blood lead relative to the others had a significant, uh, I mean bone lead uh, had a significant increase of developing hypertension. Now, let's go back and look at this. We're talking about bone lead increments. Remember I said in Dr. Who's study that the increment of 29 micrograms per gram was associated with an odds ratio for hypertension of 1.5? Well, we know that bone lead measurements in terms of concentration are related to cumulative blood lead exposure. And there have been studies where they've measured and calculated what's called a cumulative blood lead index. So for example, if you had a lead level of 20 micrograms per deciliter in your blood for 10 years, your cumulative index would be 200. Okay. The relationship, the slope between uh, bone lead and cumulative blood lead index is roughly 0 0.05. So that 29 microgram per gram increment that Dr. Hu saw translates into 580 microgram per deciliter years. Well, let's think about that in terms of a lifetime of lead exposure in the workplace. If you were exposed for 40 years, a 15 microgram per deciliter increase over that 40 years would, would equal that cumulative bone lead, which produced you know, 600, 40 years of 15 microgram per deciliter difference between, say, a blood lead of 25 compared to a blood level of 10 is equivalent to the lead level that might increase your blood pressure, your odds of having hypertension, excuse me, by, fi by 50%. Okay? So if we could avert that cumulative blood lead index by, say, not having a blood lead of 25 in the workplace, but having one of 10 for a working lifetime, we might be able to avert that increase in risk that Dr. Who found. Now, if you were to say to me or to someone else that I have a risk factor that is going to increase hypertension, you would expect that you would see an increase in cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality because hypertension is a very well-known and very well-established risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. And in fact, studies that have been conducted on the NHANES data set in which they observed a relationship between lead and blood pressure, have recently found that indeed elevated blood lead was associated with an increased risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. And this was a paper that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives in 2006 that was a 12-year longitudinal study of participants in the NHANES who were greater than 40 years of age at the time 
that they were studied, and almost 10,000 people. And compared to a reference population of those who had, or a reference subset within this population who had blood leads less than five, those who had blood leads five to nine had a, a 1.2 relative risk of dying of cardiovascular disease, and those who had blood leads greater than 10 had a 55% increase, relative risk of 1.55. This was an average of 8.5 years of follow-up. Most of these people had blood, the median was 11.8, and almost very, very few people in this, in this data set had blood leads greater than 20. And this clearly shows that, and this was after adjusting for sex, race, ethnicity, education, and smoking status. This really shows that in this population of who had blood leads in the teens, an older population who grew up with most of their life with blood leads in the teens, there was a significant relationship between the risk of, um, of dying from cardiovascular disease and their lead exposure. The normative aging study took this a step further because they had the bone lead measurements. And this is the same study I mentioned earlier by Dr. Hu, the same data set. Uh, Dr. Weisskopf, working with Dr. Hu and his colleagues, um, looked prospectively at the men who they had obtained bone lead measurements on and followed them forward um, for a period of years, average of uh, 8.9 years of follow-up. And they said, they looked at, they had very well, uh, almost 100% ascertainment of, of mortality and type of mortality. And they looked at who died of cardiovascular disease as a function of their accumulative lead exposure reflected in bone. And it was pretty striking. If you looked at the entire population, the highest tercile of bone lead compared to the lowest tercile had a 25 2.45 fold risk of dying of heart disease. If you looked at those who didn't have heart disease or stroke at the time of the prospective follow-up, it was a five-fold, greater than five-fold increase in the risk of dying. One of the key things I want you to, if you, if you re remember nothing else from this talk, one of the key things I want you to, to take home is the fact that in occupational health, we're often concerned about very subtle endpoints. Sometimes we regulate and we're concerned when someone has a slight increase in liver enzymes, or we have a subtle effect on, on reaction time or something like that, okay? There's nothing subtle about death, okay? <laughs> this is the most severe and compelling endpoint you could possibly have in occupational health. And we're showing that cumulative lead exposure predominantly in the teens, across ranges in the teens, increases the risk of death. Okay? And that is something that is very compelling, I think, as we consider the hazards. Let's, um, you know, one of the things to bear in mind is, well, why might, how is lead causing this cardiovascular mortality? Is it due to hypertension? It may be due in part to hypertension, but it's certainly not entirely due to hypertension because factors independent of hypertension may contribute very well to this cardiovascular mortality based on the various effects of lead that we have recognized. We know that lead causes oxidative stress. There have been studies that have shown that lead's been associated in human epidemiological studies with pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNS-alpha, alters endothelial cell function, in the uh, normative aging study and other studies, there have been associations of lead with alterations in cardiac conduction, such as prolonged QT and QRS intervals. So it's not all about hypertension. And in fact, here's another study that Menke uh, looked at based on uh, a prospective longitudinal analysis of participants in the NHANES study. And what he showed here, comparing the lowest tercile of blood lead to the highest tercile of blood lead, not only was there an increased risk in, in mortality from myocardial infarction, but from stroke as well. And that's uh, significant because some of the things that affect uh, the integrity of the vasculature in the heart will certainly also affect the cerebrovascular uh, circulation. And so there's also, uh, in this study, controlling for other factors, a substantial increase uh, 
and the risk of stroke. Turn to a moment uh, to the relationship between lead and renal function. Several studies, and this study on the, uh, that I'm highlighting here are just one of several, that have shown a relationship between creatinine clearance, which is a measure of renal function, and blood lead concentration. This particular study was conducted in Europe among a group of individuals who uh, lived in uh, various communities where they had a wide range of uh, lead exposures. Um, anywhere from 1.7 to 72.5 micrograms per deciliter. Most of them were general population exposures uh, with a geometric mean of 10. And what you see here, this is women and this is men, this is creatinine clearance, this is lead, this is listed in, in micrograms per liter instead of micrograms per deciliter because this is a European study. And if you can see here, like, so 33 would be 3.3, this would be 6.6, 13.2 micrograms per deciliter. There was a very strong linear relationship that as blood lead increased, uh, uh, creatinine clearance decreased. And even if you just looked at um, those who had no occupational exposure um, and you just you remove them from the study, you still saw this relationship. And this, um, this is consistent with the fact that lead could have an adverse effect on, on renal function. I think this issue is really unresolved for the fact that lead is predominantly excreted through the kidney. So the component of reverse causation, perhaps, where when you have decreased renal function, you have less lead elimination and you have a higher blood lead concentration has not been fully resolved. It's possible there's a bi-directional relationship and that they're the same, both relationships exist at the same time. But nevertheless, the data is out there and it's concerning. What about lead exposure and neurocognitive function in an occupational cohort? There have been several compelling studies that have suggested that lead exposure to adults at relatively low levels in the teens can contribute to cognitive dysfunction later in life. This particular study was conducted in Pittsburgh uh, by Cal Dr. Khalil and, and colleagues, included Dr. Herbert Needleman, many of you have heard about. And they looked at lead workers and controls who they had initially assessed in 1982 with neurocognitive function, neuropsychological tests. They went back and looked at them again, or they, looked, they recruited people from the subgroups in 2004. And the mean blood lead concentration of the workers in 1982 was 40 micrograms per deciliter. In 2004, it had fallen to 12. The control subjects in 1982 had a blood lead of 7.2. And at the time of follow-up in 2004, they had blood lead of um, three. The mean age of these workers at the time of the reassessment was about 54, plus or minus nine. And they measured not only their blood lead, but their bone lead. And they were able actually, based on assuming a half-life of bone lead uh, in tibia of 27 years, they were, be able to, they were ex back extrapolated to what the individual's bone lead would have been at their peak of end of exposure. And this is what they got, 57 and 12. Now, what they did is they related this to cognitive, the change in cognitive function over time. And what they found was about among the exposed individuals who had worked with lead, bone lead concentration was significantly uh, correlated in a negative direction with total cognitive score, score on spatial uh, reasoning and on executive function. However, in the non-exposed individuals, there was no relationship between bone lead and cognitive function. And this was after adjusting for other covariates, uh, such as age and education. Blood lead was not associated with the decline. It was the cumulative exposure. And what was interesting is that the lead exposed workers experienced a 17% greater loss in their total cognitive function compared to the non-exposed controls. Now, these were uh, workers, and they were exposed at, at lead levels you know, in the 40s. But the similar findings have been found in populations with general uh, environmental levels of exposure. 
And this was from a subset of the normative aging study. Again, a lot of major contributions have come from that, where they had men who had two sets of neurocognitive uh, functioning tests over a 3.5 year interval. The mean, median blood lead was relatively low, five micrograms per deciliter. And they looked at bone lead as a predictor of decline in cognitive function. And what they found was, as a function of your bone lead, there was a change in an individual's visual spatial performance. And here, in this particular test, I'm showing you the response latency on uh, pattern recognition. So in other words, the greater your latency, it means the slower you are to respond. And you see, as your bone lead level went up, it took you longer to respond. This is a subtle marker, but nevertheless, it's a marker that individuals with higher bone lead later in life had a greater decline in cognitive function. Dr. Hu and his colleagues did an interesting thing using a relatively new technology called proton magnetic resonance. And proton magnetic resonance is predominantly a re research tool now, but you're able to actually hone in on a small section of the brain using uh, advanced spectroscopy and measure various com chemical components of the brain. So here, for example, using this is a coronal image. They were able to take this area, I believe it was in the temporal area of the brain, temporal lobe area, and they were able to measure various different chemical constituents. Um, this one here is N-acetyl aspartase. This is myelin -ostatol. Various different chemicals that are present in the brain. And they related that to the individual's bone lead measurements. These were people who were members of that normative aging study. They weren't people who were demented. They were, they were, they were functioning individuals. And what, what they found was as you looked at increased bone lead measurements, you saw an increase rate, uh, increased concentration of myelin -ostatol. Now, myelinositol is a component of glial cells, like astrocytes, and it's thought that this is a, a measure of glial proliferation and plaque formation, which is present in uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this is perhaps a correlate to possibly uh, explain why we're seeing these, uh, this decline in cognitive function in, in, uh, the, in the elderly population as a consequence of lead exposure. This is another study that was conducted in Baltimore by uh, Dr. Shi and uh, colleagues in which they took just randomly selected individuals who lived in uh, the Baltimore area. Their mean blood lead was 3.5, and they too found that bone lead concentration was associated with decrease in visual construction skills on neuropsychological testing. And they showed that a 13 part per million increase in bone lead, which was the interquartile range between 25 to 75 percent, was associated with the same as five, almost five years extra years of aging. Now, I want you to think about something. When you're talking about an elder, an aging population, and you're talking about five more years of brain age or brain function, you know, gaining five more years of brain function by not having this exposure or losing it, that's very significant. You know, as we approach the late 70s in our country, we have about 25% of people with some element of dementia. If you can uh, save people five years of, uh, of cognitive age, or five, the effects of five years of aging in that old age, that's a significant public health impact. Let's turn finally to some issues about lead and reproductive issues. And why is this important for the workplace? Well, we have women of work reproductive age uh, as members of the workforce who are exposed to lead, and this may actually increase as time goes on. And a very interesting study and a very well-done study that was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology looked prospectively at the risk of uh, lead exposure and spontaneous abortion. These were women in Mexico City who were just appearing for routine prenatal care. They, measured, they took a blood lead measurement at the time that they enrolled, and then they looked and followed these people throughout their pregnancy every week to see who uh, had a spontaneous abortion or not. And this is what they found in terms of um, the odds ratio of having a spontaneous abortion. 
Comparing the baseline group of those who had a blood lead less than five, those who had a blood lead of 5.9 had more than double the risk of a spontaneous abortion, and those 10 to, 10 to 14, five-fold risk. This higher group, and there weren't many in that, had a 12.2-fold increased risk. Very substantial increases associated with uh, blood lead. And again, these are not lead workers. These are, these are women in, uh, in Mexico City who uh, have higher blood lead at average age of enrollment because of the prior history of a lot of air pollution from leaded gasoline and smelters in the Valley of Mexico. This study was also performed in Mexico City um, where they looked at the bone lead of the mothers and they looked at the relationship to the birth weight of their infants. The average maternal age, uh, I mean maternal bone le uh, blood lead in this cohort of 272 women was 8.9. And their maternal bone lead levels uh, were average of 9.8 with a range of 12 to 38. And in a multivariable regression model, Every uh, 10 micrograms per gram increase in maternal bone lead was associated with a, with a 73 gram decrement in birth weight. And the relationship was nonlinear and it was most significant in those in the higher quartile of bone lead, where the decrease in, uh, in bone lead, uh, excuse me, in birth weight was 156 grams. And I want to share with you one of the conclusions that the authors said. And they pointed out that lead stays in bone for quite a long time. So because of that, because lead remains in, in bone for years to decades, mobilization of bone lead during pregnancy may pose a significant fetal exposure with health consequences long after maternal external lead exposure has declined. So if a woman is working in the lead trades and is exposed to lead for 10, 15 years, then stops and then decides she's going to, or, or 10 years, let's say, and then decides she's going to become pregnant, even if she's off of work and her blood lead has come down, the long-term lead that's stored in the bones can be mobilized during the calcium mobilization that occurs and remodeling that occurs during pregnancy and still have an impact even after she's left the workplace. <coughs> Not only do we see changes in the growth of the baby's uh, interuterine and their birth weight, but we also have seen effects on head circumference. This is another study conducted in a uh, longitudinal uh, study of women in Mexico City, and they um, looked at the um, blood lead concentration of the mothers at 36 weeks and the head circumference of the infants at six months of age. And you can see this is a log scale, but as the Blood lead concentration of the mothers during gestation increased, the head circumference went down. Now, if you see lead having an adverse effect on birth weight, and if you see it having an adverse effect on the size of head circumference, you would expect, perhaps, that it would have an adverse effect on the cognitive function of the children. And that's exactly what they show. This is a study by uh, Lourdes Schnoss and her colleagues, and uh, Dr. Rothenberg was also part of this uh, study, and this looked at um, the third trimester blood lead in a prospective study of women who were being, who became pregnant and then their offspring were filed. In utero, their mothers had a, a third trimester blood lead on average of 7.8. And then they measured their IQ of these children when they were 6 to 10 years of age. And they controlled for other variables, you know, such as um, the mother's IQ, uh, the, 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 the birth weight, the socioeconomic status. After controlling for those other factors, you see as the mother's blood lead went up, the IQ of the children went down. And it went down in an, actually in a, in a, in a nonlinear pattern. It was even greater effect at lower lead levels. This is interesting because they've done prospective studies of of uh, young of children in school, and they've seen a, a nonlinear or superlinear dose response between blood lead and cognitive function. But here, this should, the reason I'm talking about the prenatal exposure is because this is the kind of exposure a woman could have when she's in the workplace. Well, taking all these issues together, <clears throat> 
we, a group of us, published a paper that appeared in Environmental Health Perspectives in March of 2007, in which we made recommendations for the management of adult lead exposure. And we basically said that for individuals who have blood leads between five or nine, we should discuss their health risks, and we particularly should take action to reduce lead exposure for women who are or may become pregnant. Oops. In blood leads between 10 to 19, we want to decrease the lead exposure. We want to increase the biological monitoring, and we want to consider removing them from exposure to avoid the long-term risks I've talked about if their blood leads don't come down, and particularly be concerned about removing them at these levels if they have already some dysfunction in various endpoints for which lead contributes, perhaps um, cardiovascular disease or hypertension or cognitive impairment. Between blood leads of 20 to 29, remove them from exposure if a repeat blood lead measured in four weeks was greater than 20. Between 30 to 39, remove them from exposure even if a single blood level was in that range. From 40 to 79, refer them for prompt medical evaluation. And greater than 80, uh, refer them for immediate and urgent medical evaluation. So let's summarize what we've talked about in this lecture. I hope I've shown and persuaded you that occupational health standards that tolerate blood lead concentrations greater than 20 are insufficiently protective of health of workers and are outdated, that low to moderate levels of lead exposure, blood lead levels in the 10 to 20 range, in the teens, are associated with a risk of hypertension and cardiovascular disease, cognitive dysfunction later in life, adverse reproductive outcomes, and a possible decrement in renal function. And that the goal is to keep blood lead levels less than 10 long term, less than five in the case of women of reproductive age, and that a single blood lead over 30 or two or consecutive blood leads over 20 med merit medical removal protection. And finally, you might see that we've come about this information over a long period of time, and I'm reminded of a letter that Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1786 when he was commenting on the fact that he had observed many occupational issues in printers and in uh, people in the various trades where they were exposed to lead, and he said, you will see to it, but the opinion of this mischievous effect of lead is at least over 60 years old, and you will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exists before it is generally received and practiced on. <laughs> I've hoped we will practice on it quite soon. Thank you for your attention.